It's time to put up the cell phones, turn off the internet and video games, and gather the family together for some quality time at home. Now what do we do? Well, you mean we have to talk to each other? If you're at a loss for what comes next, we'll give you some tips tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight comes from a fair piece, not all over the world, but far enough over in Montana. He is a Catholic convert from Judaism who uses the unique method of Jewish oral tradition to reveal how God was alive and active in the lives of the great characters that we encounter in the Bible, and how he is also alive and active in our own lives. He's a lay brother in the Franciscan community of the Brothers and Sisters of Charity. So please welcome Brother Bob Fishman. Brother Bob. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you Father Mitch. Welcome. Well, it's great to be here. Good. Yep. How are things up in Montana? Oh, beautiful, beautiful. You yeah. know, we have to get you in our neck of the woods. I, I, well, the, the, it's in, up there, it's your neck of the sky. I mean, you're oh. big sky country up oh, there, right? Oh, it is so gorgeous. And, you know, the Rocky Mountains, and I'm privileged to work for the Cathedral of St. Helena in Which uh, is supposed Montana. to be one of the prettiest cathedrals oh. in the country. It is three shades of gorgeous in one cathedral. I mean, it's an old Gothic cathedral in the Gothic style, and it is just beautiful. People yeah. come from all over the world to see it. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'll never forget meeting a man who had, uh, was raised Catholic uh, from Australia. Mm -hmm. And he joined a cult in mm -hmm. Australia, but their headquarters were near Yosemite. Wow. And he moved there because they were saying the end of the world was coming. Right. So... It didn't come right away. <laughs> <laughs> wow, color me surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he went to work. He, he was uh, very well educated. He's got, uh, I think, one or two PhDs mm -hmm. in environmentalism. And he went to work for the government of Montana hmm. in their environmental protection. Hmm. And it was going to the cathedral in Mo Helena. And that's St. Helen's Cathedral, That's correct? right. Yeah, he went into the cathedral and as soon as he walked in, he said, now I'm at home. Oh. And it, that's what helped bring him back. The beauty of that cathedral helped bring him back to the faith. Praise be to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, I love hearing stories like that. Well, that's what we're here to talk about. That's tonight, right. The stories. That's because, right. Because, you know, this is one of those things that is a very important part of the, the Bible itself. Right. Uh, the Bible depends on oral tradition mm -hmm. uh, and before it was written down. And... It's also part of Jewish tradition outside the Bible. That's right. Talk to us a little bit about this. Well, oral tradition goes back to uh, the times when, like in the Old Testament, it would say, pass down these stories from generation to generation. You tell your children and let them tell their children and their children's children. And it's always been a powerful way of communication. Mm -hmm. uh, almost every family has a storyteller in it, you know, and, but these stories were passed down because they were stories of heroes, of men and women of God, and they needed to be preserved. And so when I talk about oral tradition, I'm not talking about made up fairy tales or anything else. I'm talking about stories of the holy, stories that are passed down in a family as sacred and, and that uh, means something to their tradition. And, and uh, the Jewish religion and the Old Testament is filled with great stories that were passed down, just like, you know, sitting around a table and, and uh, sharing a story, or maybe sitting around a fire or a, a fireplace or a campfire and sharing stories and uh, uh, powerful things. And I love oral tradition because it's exciting. It makes it real. You know, it, it takes it out of the book. Sometimes when we read stories in the Bible, they go in one eyeball and out the other. You know, we, uh, we get so blurred, we don't picture ourselves there. And oral tradition helps put you in the story. 
there, there's so, something that I like to do in teaching scripture, and that is to try and go back to the ancient context. Mm-hmm. And under, we, we have to understand the Old Testament characters in that ancient context. That's and right. yet at the same time, to see that they have the same basic humanity we do, and that their reactions are human reactions in their culture for their times. And once we understand it through that filter, we can then begin to understand our own human reactions. That's and that's right. a very important element. That's right. And when we're reading the Old Testament and the, the stories, it, you almost ask questions like you were a news reporter. The who, what, where, when, and what, what's happening at the time? Who are they talking to? When is this story taking place? And it helps put it in context. And when a story is in context, then you get it better and you understand what was going on at the times. So uh, when people talk about uh, exile or they talk about being captives or whatever, it helps to know uh, Bible history. And it hel- and you don't have to be a theologian to know it. You just have to read um, sections either before the passage or after the passage and help put it in context. Yeah. And uh, and play news reporter. Who yeah. is speaking? What, who are they speaking to? Where is this? When is this? And uh, and then it it comes all together, and then it gives you a fuller sense of the stories and the characters involved. Another thing too that I mean, this is where some of the background that I've been privileged to have uh, comes in. You know, they're living at different periods of history. Right. You know, Abraham is list living in the Middle Bronze Age. Mm-hmm. Moses lives at the late Bronze Age, and David and Solomon are in the early Iron Age, too. You know, so these cultural differences also have an impact on the way we understand them. That's right. And that's one of the other things that we need to study and why it, it's a, it, it can sound daunting, but it's actually a lot of fun to be able to study. It is beautiful. The, um, uh, Jeff Cavins and uh, Dr. Scott Hahn put together a thing called the Bible Timeline. Right. And I still use it, and I use it uh, when I'm sharing the faith or teaching as the DRE. I'll put up the big timeline, and it has all the different ages and the years and the things that were going on. So it gives people a perspective. So when they read a certain story that's a part of history, they know what's happening at the time. And it, political uh, figures affect stories, the times, the culture, uh, what, the inventions, you know, the things that were making that society prosper at the time. All of that ties in. And it helps you understand Scripture better exactly. because Scripture is not to be read like a novel. It's not like Gone with the Wind where you just open it up. and It's, it's a library, and it's filled with history and with great characters and with great uh, stories to bring us to the deeper uh, love relationship with our Lord. You know, uh, your new series, by the way, is called mm-hmm. what? The Family Hearth. What is a hearth? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Well, the hearth is traditionally the place around like a fireplace. They would call that a hearth. And uh, it was um, in, in olden days, the cooking took place there. Uh, the family gathered around the fire to keep warm. And oftentimes they told stories there. And now I think the family hearth is not so much about a fireplace, but it's about communication. It can be around a kitchen table. It could be around a living room. It could be on a couch or a sofa. It's somewhere where you share the stories of who you are, of your own history, what went on in the day, that kind of things. And and then every once in a while, you share the stories of the holy. And that really, the hearth is more uh, a place in the heart for a family to gather and to shut off all the electronic stuff and shut off all the uh, cell phones and computers and all that other stuff and talk to each other. Why do you think people are not talking so much today? Uh, 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 oy vey. I think it's because of uh, our, uh, some of our children are being turned into isolationists. They come home, they're they're on the text and the tweets and all the other things, and then they go into their room and they're on computers and cell phones and all that stuff, and they're solitude, they're solitary, and it isolates and it, it almost divides. And when people actually sit down to talk to each other, uh, it's hard. I mean, I, I just saw a commercial a few days ago where a mom and a daughter are in the same room, but they don't talk to each other, they're texting each other. And I thought, how sad. 
You know, that we've, we're starting, I hope, as a culture, we don't lose that, where we gather together and just talk and, and share things and um, express ourselves with each other without the use of texting and tweeting and all that other stuff. <coughs> One of the other components of texting, tweeting, and, and so on is that there's a major difference from the way I was raised. <laughs> yeah. When, when we didn't, have, of course, we didn't have those things, but... <coughs> There was another component that a child can uh, text, tweet, and use the Internet to talk to his peers mm-hmm. in his room, right. even when they're not there. That's right. Whereas in the old days, the, one of the things that happened is when we crossed the threshold of the door, we were out of the world of kids and of our peers, and we were in the adult world. That's and right. What one of the things that happens is that the world of the young keeps being brought back into the house and children don't make the connection with the older generation. That's they right. stay with their own generation. So it's not just isolation. It's also staying with your own generation and not with the older generation. And this is a problem. That's right. They're not learning the wisdom from uh, our older people. You know, like, for instance, my grandfather used to come from Brooklyn, New York. And I loved it when he came because he would come and he'd socialize a little bit. And then, you know, after things settled down, he would sit down and he'd go, so, Bob, how's it going? How are you doing? Really? You know, and it was an outlet and uh, we could share wisdom and he would share stories from when he was a child. You know, one of the saddest statistics, um, and I read this in Psychology Today a few years ago, was about uh, college graduates who couldn't name where the country where their great grandparents came from. And I thought, how sad is this? You know, that they're losing this connection to the uh, to their past to their to the generations before them and i would love hearing stories about uh, my my grandfather came from poland and uh, you know and he would tell me stories and he called it the old country and he had and whenever he talked about it he had that twinkle in his eye yeah. you know and it, and it even though i may not have understood everything he was sharing with me at the time it touched me i knew uh, we had a connection and he would share with me stories of old, and, they, and then he would give me advice. And, you know, we miss that in our generation. The older men are not talking to the younger men, and older women talking to the younger women. My, my father's father died before I was born, but my step-grandfather uh, would tell me stories. Hmm. about. He was from a, a, a village in uh, Belarus, mm-hmm. and, and to hear his stories, you know, it was always fun. Uh, right. One time... Uh, he'd always tell me the story of how they were on a train and the train stopped because of a snow drift. Mm-hmm. And they all had to get out and shovel the snow off. Right. And then he said, and then the wolf came. <laughs> At which point my grandmother always interrupted and said, Roman, don't talk like that, those kids. And because she was from Poland. Right. And so I, so I asked him years later as an adult, what happened when the wolf came? And he said, I don't remember. <laughs> you know, but it, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, uh, I waited too long to find out what happened when the wolf came. I waited till yep. he was 90 years old uh, when my grandmother finally stopped stopping him. But <laughs> it, it's important that we don't stop the stories from being That's told right. because some of them are exciting and some of them are, uh, are just interesting. That's right. And it's wisdom. It's wisdom of the ages. And oftentimes people have been through life. You know, they've been down roads. Sometimes we think, oh, the older generation, they they don't know what I'm going through. How could they relate to me? Well, you know, they went through much more difficult times and they made it. And then them sharing with you right. will help you so that you avoid the same pitfalls or things and, uh, and learn how to appreciate I, the, the advice as a gift, you know, to be gifted the, the, those words of wisdom and to appreciate them when they come. But there's, there's a mutual quality to this, too, mm-hmm. because there has to be a willingness by the older generation to tell the stories. Right. And also to develop the skill in telling stories. That's right. And there has to be a willingness of the younger generation to listen to the stories. That's right. And this is one of the things that has to go on. You know, how do we you know, encourage people to be willing to listen and to talk? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, I, I think is part of the problem. 
one of the things I love about uh, being raised Jewish is oftentimes, especially the, oh, my, my grandparents, they would answer a question with a question. So you couldn't, if they asked you how your day was and you said fine, they wouldn't let the conversation end there. Fine, what does fine mean? Though, how are things going? And they would all keep questioning until it bro- brought it out. I think some of the t- times, um, especially our young people, are used to these one word or three word phrases, you know, and they just spew them out and they think that's the end of the conversation. So, how are you doing, Father Mitch? I'm doing fine. How was your day? It was good. Okay. And then the conversation dies there. And I, I think we need to develop the art form of breaking out of that, you know, of, of saying, okay, well, what, what does fine mean? What, tell me about your day. Maybe rephrase the questions a little bit and uh, enter into conversation. And this is one of the things where the parents themselves then have to, you know, probe into what's going on with their lives as well as be willing to share. And, and I remember talking to my cousins. I was in Poland uh, mm-hmm. some back in 1979. And they asked me about American young people. Hmm. And one of the things that they said was, it sounds to us as if American young people do not know the hearts of their parents. Oh. Hmm. Which is a Great w- very interesting way to put it. Yep. You know, that it's not just enough to know information and data about hmm. your parents. Right. But to know what's in your parents' heart. Hmm. This is something else that has to go on, so that w- which means parents have to have a willingness to be somewhat vulnerable and be willing to, to let you know down some defenses that's right to say this is what's in my heart for you, and this you know it's not just that I want you to succeed I mean, this is what's in my this is what I feel in my heart for you, and that kind of vulnerability is a real honoring thing to a child, that you you honor Mm. the child to let them know what's in your heart. That's right. And opening up, like you said, having that willingness to break down the walls, to be vulnerable, to admit, look, I've made mistakes too. And I've, uh, you know, done these things and I'm not proud of it. But not being, uh, not hiding behind them, but sharing them so that your children don't make the same ones. Or they feel like they can turn to you because of what you've been through in your own life. And uh, it does. And it's on both parts. You know, the, um, many of our young people have so many great stories to share yeah. uh, from themselves. Exactly. And, uh, and I think sometimes they're be- they can share them on texting and tweeting and on the computer and all of that stuff. But when it comes to talking or sharing them verbally, they have trouble. And I think... Um, I think if we were all a little more vulnerable to each other and really willing to talk, really willing to sit down and not wait till it's such a serious issue that, you know, um, that everyone's on the defensive, but to just sit down and really share with each other. And uh, and I think that goes back to the essence of what a heart is. You know, uh, I love the fact that families eat together. You know, that's one of my big strong points. I encourage them to at least eat one meal a day or more together as a family because around the dinner table, you know, you can share things and then bring it into the living room. You know, you don't have to go immediately to the television set or immediately to your rooms or whatever and, uh, and encourage dialogue. But it do, we do need to be vulnerable and be willing to share. You know, one of the things, too, about letting children share is that, you know, they're not, just because they're children, they're not always that good at being verbal. That's right. You know, they, they're, that's what they're learning. That's right. And so there has to be a certain kind of patience on the part of parents because they can say, and, and then you know what happened? And, and then this happened? And then, then you know what? And then this happened, you know, well, it's going to be halting in a certain way. It won't flow so smoothly because that's what they're still learning. That's right. But there needs to be a patience with that and an interest that a parent also shows in telling and listening to the stories of the children. I have to share this with you. One of the greatest joys in my whole life is my six-year-old grandson. 
His name is Mason. He's a joy, and every day I get to spend a little bit of time with him after he's done. He's now in first grade. And so he'll tell me about how his day went. And I'll share with him, but you have to share on an age-appropriate oh, level. Right, exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll share how my, level, how my day went with him. And he understands, you know, um, I, I don't tell him super specifics, but I, I tell him, you know, oh, I had a, a good day, or uh, this was a day where I, I could have used a little bit of prayer. And, you know, or I'm, if I'm feeling stuffed up or sick, I'll say, you know, will you, will you say a, a Hail Mary with me or will you pray with me? Or I'll ask him how his day went and he'll say, well, I got in trouble at the playground or this person pushed me and, and I got my name written on the board. And I'll say, okay, well, what happened? And, well, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> you know? It never <laughs> is. Yeah, that's right. But, the, you know, it leads into dialogue. And I want him to understand that it's okay to feel that way, to have feelings of you know, uh, I felt like today wasn't such a good day. Not all days, some days are diamonds, some days are rocks. You know, you're not, and every day is not going to be a gem. And it's okay to feel that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any other grandkids? No, he's, uh, he's, he's the, the first one, one the first so one. far. So Very, far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise be to God. But uh, yeah, he, teach, he teaches me about life and about, and about God. How, how does he teach you about life? Uh, I'll give you a great example. Uh, he just recently learned how to play kickball. All right. And, and so we were out in the front yard and, and we're playing uh, a kickball. And he, he said to me, do you notice that there are fr- there's fruit on the ground? And I said, fruit on the ground? And sure enough, we have a small plum tree. And when he was kicking the ball, it hit against the tree in some some things fell and he came over and picked up one of the the things and he said what is this and I said it's a plum and I you've had them before and he said oh it comes from this tree and I said yeah and can I eat it and I said sure and he you know took a bite of it and it was like he had tasted God's candy for the first time and he was amazed that it grew on a tree and there it was (laughs) and it it just and and then I got to see it through the eyes of a six-year-old again Because sometimes we're so caught up in, you know, being Brother Bob and I got to do this and I got to do that and la-di-da and I got a schedule and it's crazy that we don't take time to stop and see the beauty that's all around us. Like he'll say, I I plant flowers in our little walkway and he'll say, oh, the flowers, they're so beautiful. And I'll say, yeah, they're singing to God. See how they're singing? And he'll go, he understands that. Uh You know, he he doesn't say, well, what are they singing? He'll say, oh, yeah, I can see because they're praising God with what they have as a flower. They're just singing to God. The, The trick is to notice it, to look down. And, you know, that old expression, stop and smell the roses. Well, sometimes we need to do that. We're so busy walking around like we got a mouthful of sour gummy worms and we're, you know, uh, got our face all persimmoned up and we're heads hunched down that we have to take time and just enjoy the beauty around us. And he helps me see that. Oh, that's cool. It's that's very cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure that your, your, you know, your, your children enjoy. I don't the know if they have gummy worms out here. Do they, the, the candy? I think the wagon train brought Okay, uh, <laughs> the wagon train. <laughs> of course you've got coming. They're the sour things. Look, mm, if the wagon your train good. can get out to Montana, can get here to Alabama. Uh, what good, do you good, think good. this well. is? Not that I eat them myself. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't care for that stuff Yeah, it'll, it'll definitely make you a sour face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, plus it's too, too much sugar. But uh, that's another problem. Yeah, because that's one of the things about old age. <laughs> that's right. I don't care for that's some right. Of this I, stuff and you know, stuff. you know, you're you know you are old when you get up and your body makes more noise than the chair you were sitting in. Yeah, that's yeah, when you know. That's when you know old age. Yeah. Well, it's you know, um, one of the things that uh, would also be good to think about is what are some of the benefits of having that kind of conversation what hmm. what flows from it oh many things first off it's a deep connection it's a bond it's uh two people sharing and 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 becoming uh close with each other and intimate and creating that family strength one of the things that we promote in the family hearth series is gather the kids around, bring even your pets I even say you know bring your pets or whatever your family consists of and gather around. 
because I want to share stories or share a teaching from our Lord or whatever, but to do it in a way that the whole family is involved in. And I think that's so important, not just to have a, a five-minute discussion, but to share with the whole family, you know, and how did your day go? What was going on in, in your life today? And and then also not be afraid to share stories. You know, all of us have Bibles, and we all, you know... I share, hope they do. I hope so, too. And a good Catholic Bible, by the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, they uh, share stories and not just read them, but read them and tell them. You know, uh, oftentimes people say... How can I get my family to pray a rosary? Because I love the rosary. And I tell people to pray it as a family. And they look at me like, oh, Brother Bob, my kids will never sit still for that. You know, I, I can't get them excited about it. And one of the things I tell them is let them lead a decade or get a scriptural rosary book that has a line for each uh, bead and, uh, and tell them the story. When we talk about the visitation, don't just say the visitation. Have them say when Mary went to Elizabeth and they stayed for three months, you know, two pregnant Jewish women together for three months. You want to talk about funny? That, that, that could have some humor in it. And the beauty of that. But see, one of the things that can also go on with that is there. Are, you know, you have to deal with child appropriate. That's levels. right. That's right. Yeah. And I think sometimes using children's Bibles and telling those Bible stories, you know, and do say so one of the things that some friends of mine do because they have very small children mm -hmm. is they only say one decade of the Rosie because their Great. children were you know six down through babies. Yep. Uh, and so. They, can, they only have the attention span for one decade. That's right. And but keep can, it age appropriate. Right, right. But they could read a, a, a story of the mystery mm -hmm. and then pray the mystery. And yeah. that's, that's the kind of thing that would be, a, as a matter of fact, I think somebody ought, that'd be a great task, uh, somebody to write a uh, Bible storybook for the rosary. There you go. Well, there I go. There you go. Well, <laughs> You're the storyteller. Yeah. Well, and uh, you know, and that's that's the that's the truth. We need to use, and we have so many great tools in our church. So many great nuggets of truth and things. Not only stories of uh, the Bible, but also stories of the saints. I mean, one of the things I learned when I converted to the to the faith, I knew nothing about saints. You know, and when I learned their stories and that they were men and women just like us who struggled through the same things we struggle through and they made it. And I thought, you know, these maybe I could, too. And their stories were were beautiful. And those are stories also that you can share um, around a, a family hearth. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about that, but I want to take a break now. We'll come back in a couple of minutes and continue on with this conversation. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back. Uh, before we get back to Brother Bob Fishman, uh, just want to remind you that if you have a chance to come here and make a pilgrimage, we would love to see you. It always is a real joy to have people in our live audience. And if you can uh, contact our pilgrimage department by calling them at 205-271-2966. That's 205 271 or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. 
they'll help you with all kinds of information about places you can stay, uh, the restaurants you can go to eat. Remember, I, I have a lot of favorites right here in Irondale, Alabama. <laughs> Irondale's a small little town, but we've got religiously themed restaurants and a famous restaurant. The famous one is from the Fried Green Tomatoes movie. And you can go down there and get you some fried green tomatoes, and they're delicious. I like to have a little bit of vinegar with hot sauce in it. That's, okay. that's, that's, that's really good. But also, you know, we've got Hamburger Heaven, and we've got the uh, uh, Golden Rule Barbecue. I mean, we've got all sorts of religious themes here. So we want you to come and join us for the programs, be here for the masses, and come make, get a free tour of the, the studios. Uh, all of this is uh, kind of a cool thing to do. So come on down and join us. And now Amen. back to you. All right. Uh, let's, uh, for, we haven't really talked much about your new series. Right. And I'd like to, uh, we talked about the theory of this series and how right. this is about the family hearth. But what this new series, I know that you're, what you're doing is uh, taking a look at the parables of Jesus. That's right. Uh, Tell us a little bit about this. Well, in the first season of The Family Hearth, we focused on Old Testament stories. And this time around, we wanted to incorporate the parables of Jesus and uh, talk about the different uh, teachings that he had. And uh, it, it's beautiful because it's a chance. Jesus was the greatest storyteller there was. I mean, he, he, the w- way he told stories, it touched people, not just on an intellectual level, but it touched them on a heart level. And if you read the parables, they're on many different levels. And that's why they're always new and alive and fresh. Um, one of the shows that we're doing uh, this time around is on the prodigal son. And one of my favorite lines in the prodigal son parable is a little phrase, and it's talking about the father when he sees the prodigal son returning home and it says he ran to him he ran to him and that always touched me because in the story you know the the prodigal son the younger son has uh, taken his inheritance has blown it on wild living and all this other stuff a famine hits the land and he winds up in working on a pig farm and longing to eat the slop that the pigs would eat and for a jewish person that's the ultimate low the lowest of the low yeah, yeah, and p- then hanging around a pig farm is not exactly kosher. <laughs> that's right. Hey, good, well put. And that's exactly right. And uh, he decides that, you know, maybe I can go home. And I think we've all been in that place where, you know, maybe we've made a mistake. Maybe we've made poor choices in our lives or whatever. And maybe we've reached that low, the bottom of the bottom. And uh, he longs to go home. And he doesn't know how he'll be received. He doesn't know if he'll even, you know, be welcomed or anything else. He's just longing to work as a servant on the place. And as he draws closer and the father sees him, the father runs to him. And that's so important because our Lord is not a puppet master. He doesn't pull our strings. Our Lord is not a holy linebacker. He won't tackle us from behind. But if we turn even a little bit to him, he runs to us. He runs to us and the father running to him and embracing him. And I mean, it's a story about reconciliation. It's a story about humility. It's a story about um, being restored. What was lost is now found. And it's powerful and beautiful. And there's such richness in it. And so this season on the family hearth, we wanted to focus in on the teachings of our Lord and Savior. One of the things I love about the prodigal son is what Pope John Paul II had written in Divas and in Misericordia, Rich in Mercy. Mm -hmm. And he says how by showing mercy to the prodigal son, the father restored his relationship. Had he been aloof and let him just work for him, then he would no longer be a father, but he'd be um, a master. But by well, running to him, as you mentioned, and going and embracing him and putting a ring on his finger to show that he belongs back in the family. That's right. You know, this is you know, all a, a very important element of being able to maintain his role as father. And that's another great side of it, that he, he's able to stay father because he welcomed the prodigal son home. That's right. And it, it's beautiful. The father gives him three things. He gives him the robe to restore his dignity. He puts the ring on, as you said, to restore him as part of the authority of the family. And then he gives him sandals for his feet. 
and in, and servants used to go barefoot and uh, sandals uh, and I, I think so he won't run again and he he's welcomed home fully and restored and uh, 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 just a beautiful story and you know and sometimes I tell people put yourself in the story think about what you're reading because sometimes we read and like uh, you know it goes in one eye out the other we don't put ourselves there One of the things I love about our church, uh, St. Ignatius, you know, used to say, use your imagination for good things. Put yourself in the story. You know, imagine yourself on the beach while Jesus is teaching out in a rowboat. You know, or imagine yourself at uh, uh, at the foot of the cross as you're watching uh, the sorrow of our Lord. Or imagine, you know, a leper being healed or and what it meant to be a leper. You know, to have to shout unclean and have to go show yourself to the priest and all these things. And one of the things I, w- I want to do in this series is to bring those out, to give people images and so that they can build their own stories on them, how it touched their lives. You know, like I uh, maybe develop a conversation between a father and a son about how uh, they may have run away from uh, God or done, made some uh, foolish choices and God welcomed them back. In. And, you know, it's, it's a starting place. It's not the be, end, be all and end all. It's a, it's a beginning place to encourage dialogue between families. And I want them to watch it as a family show. You know, gather around the family hearth and uh, watch it as a family. And uh, hopefully it'll be entertaining, not too boring or anything. But it, it's a starting place. And then after it's over, to talk about it and share some of the things uh, uh, from their own lives with their children or what what other parables did you look at oh boy well we looked at the good samaritan yeah which is we'll just find there oh well the good samaritan is is a great story too because we have the uh, priest and the levites you know walking by this guy who's been beaten up robbed and stripped left in a ditch half dead okay and the levite and the uh, priest walk by him now in uh, mosaic law if somebody looked dead, basically you didn't touch them. You know, there was, you, you didn't want to... Especially, especially priests and uh, Levites. Priests and Levite, that's right. And so they weren't being arrogant as much as they were, uh, you know, uh, obeying or being perceptive of the Mosaic Law. Plus, I think there might have been a l- busyness. You know, they had a lot of things on their minds or whatever, and they're walking by. Well, the, the, the legislation was that of, of just to this day... Uh, someone who is a Jewish priest can't go to a cemetery, right? Because the, the religion is the religion of the living, not right. a religion of the dead. That's right. And so that's part of the tradition. But you can use that very positive value as a way to excuse yourself from obligations of charity. That's right. And then for a Samaritan of all people, a Samaritan, because when Jesus is telling this story. He's telling it to a young lawyer. And the lawyer had just asked him the question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And uh, our Lord throws it back at him and says, what do you think? And he says, well, you have to uh, love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, our Lord says, yeah. This was a standard answer by, uh, you see it in a lot of the rabbinic literature, in the Mishnah and so on. So this was a standard Jewish answer. Uh, that those are the two great commandments. That's right. And th- then he asks the question, well, who is my neighbor? And that brings the story forth from our Lord. And our Lord is trying to break him out of the way he's thinking, as our Lord does with us. You know, sometimes we get stuck in, our, in the way that we're thinking in our own little paradigms, and our Lord wants us to break out of that. You know, we're called to be supernatural people, not just natural people, and to be holy. And so he uses a Samaritan in this example. And the lawyer can't even say Samaritan. He's uh, at the end of the story. Our Lord says, which one of these three people was the neighbor to this man? Was it the Levite, the priest, or the guy who took him and the Samaritan who took him and healed his wounds and bandaged him and then took him to an inn and said, hey, put it on my tab, whatever this guy, whatever it takes to fix him up, I'll pay for it. Who was the neighbor? And the lawyer can't even say the Samaritan. He says the foreigner. I guess it was the foreigner. You know that. And uh, but our Lord is trying to reach him on a deeper level, not play head games, but open up his heart. 
And, and see, and this is also an area where it's good to have some of that background that, you know, King John Hyrcanus, uh, who is the king of the, the Jews, uh, back around 100 uh, B.C., destroyed the Samaritan temple. Right. And then later on, the Samaritans, right around when Jesus was a little boy, they threw the bones of a dead guy into the Jewish temple to desecrate oh. it during Passover. Wow. And that caused a big riot. So there were these, these tensions were very real, and they were attacking each other at the center of their religion, at their two temples. So that's, right. that, that's one of the reasons why there would be so much tension. That's right. And they weren't allowed to help rebuild. The Samaritans were made up of Jews and Palestinians who kind of intermarried. And, and uh, it caused great divisions. Oh. And you see it even in Scripture. And, uh, but that's right. a great th- a story. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it was one of, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the Samaritans married a Jewish woman. And despite that, he wasn't allowed to help rebuild Jerusalem. Right. And so that was, that was the beginning of the tension. So this, this tension goes way, way back to the 5th century B.C. Very cool. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, we also, I don't want our audience to think that we don't touch on the Old Testament, too, because we do. And in this series, we uh, do a few shows uh, from Old Testament characters. And one is on Tobit. You know, Tobit is a book that doesn't, it was never made into a movie, at least that I know of. And so a lot of people don't know the story. And I, actually, I love it. Now, this, this goes way before you were born. All right, take me back. I'm ready. But there was a television ser- show about Tobit. Really? That was produced by a Jewish group. Really? Really. Uh, way back around 1955. No, wow. Maybe even, no, no, earlier, 54, 54. Uh, and I remember watching it as a little boy. Wow. So, you know, the, so there was something done way back in the 50s. Well, but, uh, I, like I say, that's before you were born. Well, a, a little bit before, <laughs> not that much. But, uh, you know, it's amazing to me that so many of us, uh, so many people don't know the story. And I tell them, I even tell my Protestant friends, get a Catholic Bible, even if it's just for reference alone. Because there you'll have stories of Hanukkah, you'll have stories of the Maccabean Revolt and all of that, and you'll also have the story of Tobit, which is a great story about marriage and angels and demons and love and and all kinds of stuff uh, and healings. I mean, it's, it's just a great story, and it's told as a story. You know, exactly. because uh, Tobit is a storyteller and he's recounting his own history as it starts off. It's told in a narrative form and it's a exactly. great read. And uh, so that's one of the uh, stories we want, we bring to life or try to. And uh, it's exciting. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's uh, one of the very common readings for weddings comes from the wedding night of right. Tobit and Sarah in, in that book. That's right. I, I don't know if you knew this, but this goes along with your, th- with your theme. You know, a lot of people don't realize that Poland had become Lutheran hmm. by 1550. Hmm. And there was a, a, a very large Lutheran population. The Jesuits went into Poland and they started a series of theaters. Huh. And they, I think they had over 30 theaters all around the country. And they would put on biblical plays. Wow. And most of the plays were about Tobit and the Maccabees and the other books that the Lutherans had taken out of the Bible. (laughs) And Hmm. they told these stories and made people want to have those stories back. And they couldn't have them if they stayed Lutheran. Right. And it was in that storytelling of Tobit and and the Maccabees and Judith and so on that, Mm -hmm. that those plays helped bring people back to the Catholic faith by telling these stories in play form. Wow. And using those particular books. Wow. That's amazing. And, you know, I remember reading about John Paul II as an actor, you know, in underground theater in, uh, uh, during, the and war. during the war. Right. And, you know, it, storytelling again, whether in theater form, whether orally, whether, you know, conversing uh, on a couch or whatever, that's all part of it. And it, it's and I want people to be excited about their faith. 
You know, we should be proud to be Catholic. We have so much richness and gems to choose from and to to learn from in our tradition. And building on the Old Testament and the stories of our forefathers. And, uh, you know, I guess the family hearth is kind of like that phrase. Tell these stories to your children and your children's children and pass them on. And, uh, you know, and do them in your own unique style and way. Now, you also have a section about the Blessed Mother. I do. The last uh, uh, two episodes, we did a special presentation about uh, Mary, our Jewish mother. And it's the life of Christ through the eyes of the Blessed Virgin Mary as a Jewish mom. You know, like I talked about the uh, visitation, you know, uh, uh, Mary going to visit Elizabeth and uh, together for three months, two pregnant Jewish women. And to think about that, and uh, the special presentation is a little more dramatic. I, I get to be a little more of a ham bone, and I'm, you know, moving around a, a lot more. But there are so many things to think about, like even the nativity. When you picture Mary holding the baby Jesus, it's the first time in human history that someone could look down and see heaven looking back at them. You know, and little beautiful things like that. What was it like to have Jesus' teeth on your finger? Or, you know, did Mary tickle him or, or things like that? Or uh, when uh, talking about the passion and all the things that our Lord went through, um, his miracles, you know, and what was it like to see a leper get healed or a blind man and how much they must have rejoiced and went over to Mary and said, you know, thank you for giving birth to this and to your son because now I can see. I was once blind, I, I'm a leper and I'm clean, look, you know, all those things. And when you put yourself in uh, that story and you start to visualize it, it takes on a whole new connotation. And it's a, it's a wonderful, and at every show, anything I ever do, I try to dedicate to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, one, one part of that story that's you know, probably the most poignant is Mary at the cross. Do you talk about that? Oh, yes. Yes. And um, it's amazing to me that a lot of Jesus's followers, you know, they they left the scene. They were probably fearing getting arrested or whatever. And it's, it's just a difficult thing. But to have, you know, our Lord on the cross, and I think what hurt more than having a crown of thorns on his head, having whip marks on his back and being beaten and bloodied and having nails in his hands and his feet. What hurt more than all of that was looking down and seeing his mom looking back. You know, he had talked about the crucifixion and he had talked about the suffering that he would go through, but there it was, it was happening. And for Mary to look up and think, that's my baby up there, you know? I mean, that's a mother. And um, to to see that connection and to to put yourself there and take it out, you know, not so much theological, but as just a mom and a son, you know, and it makes it real and it powerful, powerful. Yeah. And um, when you start to meditate, it opens up uh, uh, the suffering of our Lord in whole new ways. And then to think of yourself as being there and. Yeah. Her standing next to John, you know, a teenager, essentially, the only one that didn't flee like everyone else. And then the other women there at the foot of the cross. But um, powerful stuff to think about. So, yeah, that's just some of it. Little tidbits. I want to give little teasers so that people will tune in and watch and hopefully gather their family around and uh, get blessed. What, What are some of the other parables that you dealt with? Oh, let's see. We uh, we deal with well. The prodigal son and the the good Samaritan are some of the primary ones. We talk about the wedding feast at Cana, and uh, that's that that goes back to the Blessed Mother. Right. What what do you deal with in terms of the (laughs) wedding feast? Well, we have some fun with it because it's a humorous story. If you think about it, the wedding feast at Cana, they come. There's no wedding, uh, no wine at the wedding. They run out, and essentially the water that is used. Uh, they used, it says in scripture, the water for ritual purification. And at a wedding, when you would come and you were guests, they would normally wash the dust off of your feet, uh, pour water in a basin and wash your feet off or wash your hands off or whatever, and then take that water and dump it back into these jars. 
And uh, when, Jesus, when Jesus decides to work the miracle there and uh, listens to his mother, and it's also the last time that Mary ever talks in Scripture. She says, do whatever he tells you uh, to the wine steward. That's the last time she ever talks in Scripture. But these, he has these water jars filled up to the brim. They're already, they've already got ritual water in them, and he fills them up to the brim. And then he calls over a wine steward, the head wine steward, with a ladle, or something to taste the wine. Now, imagine if you're a um, servant there or a wine steward and you filled these jars that have foot washing water in them all the way to the brim and then Jesus is calling over the head guy. Now, I can imagine these stewards in the background snickering and laughing going, you got to be kidding. This guy's going to drink this water. Are you kidding? It's and here comes the head waiter with a, a ladle or a spoon and goes to taste it. And it's the finest wine he has ever had. The best wine he's ever had. But it's, it's, if you put yourself there, it can be very funny and a, a very humorous story. And I understand and that you were in Cana. Yes. And yes. you actually saw one of these jars. Well, there, there's a, I, we don't know, and it would be too much to say, it is one of the jars that was at the wedding feast. Right, right. But there is one very ancient and very large, it, it's the right size, it, you know, because it, it says up to 27 gallons. Mm-hmm. And it, it uh, 18 to 27 gallons. And... This would be exactly the right size hmm. for that. It is ancient, and it is made out of stone. Huh. And it was, I remember when I first went to, the, to Cana back in the 1980s and 90s, this was in the basement of the church, the undercroft of the church. And they told us that it was part of an old uh, well that had been hmm. dried up and just filled up with dirt. Well, for the year 2000, they decided to clean the church, and they cleaned. They wanted to dig down to the archaeological materials that were there, and they dug through and found all sorts of pottery and things like that. But hmm. they found that this was not a well; it was a huge water jar huh. made out of stone. Wow! And one of the other reasons in Jewish law for a stone water jar is that if a jar was made out of clay and something unclean touched it, you Mm. had to smash the jar. But if it was a stone jar or a stone utensil, then you didn't have to break it. You just had to wash it, and then you could use it again. Hmm. And so at the high priest houses, they would have a lot of stone uh, measuring cups, Mm -hmm. and because if something unclean touched it, you would have to smash it, you could reuse it. Right. And to have a stone water jar for purification means that if something impure did touch it, then you still could reuse it, just have to wash it out again. Right. So, so that was one of the things that was going on. And when they discovered this, they, they cleaned out all the dirt level in, in, in the undercroft, and they, they leave that stone water jar right there. So it, it's available to, for anybody to go see if you get to the wedding church at Cana. Wow. That is so fascinating. And yeah. I'm always fascinated when I learn of your travels and the places that you get to go and uh, have been to. It's, it's amazing to me. But yeah. we, we tie the wedding feast at Cana, of course, into the Eucharist. And we talk about uh, uh, the Eucharist and the, the blessings. And, the, and I, talk, I give the Jewish blessing over the wine. Mm-hmm. You know, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Borei Pri Hagofen. And uh, the, blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. Right. And if that prayer sounds familiar, it should. We say it at Mass or something very similar when the gifts are being presented. And uh, the priest says the bread from the earth and the wine from the vine, or the grape from the vine. One of the things I also like pointing out is that the changing of the water into wine happens right before Passover, the first okay. Passover. And, at the second Passover, Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fish. Oh, that's good. And at the third Passover, he changes bread and wine into his body and blood. So uh-huh. there's also a great linkage between the three Passovers. Ooh, that's and, good. See? I might have to write that down. I like that. <laughs> that's very good. 
<laughs> I'm glad you like well, it. Well, there you go. But I didn't write it. I, didn't, <laughs> I always say I've got good writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, <laughs> as Archbishop Sheen used to say. Well, first, I just want to remind people that uh, Brother Bob Fishman's series is called The Family Hearth. And you can get some of the earlier versions of this through E.W. Ten's religious catalog. You can call them at 1-800-854-6316, 1-800-854-6316, or go to ew 10 religiouscatalogcom Also, if you order from Religious Catalog, My Holy Land Rosary, you can see a picture of that stone jar because it's in the Luminous Mystery section. Excellent. Brother Bob, thank you much. Oh, it Appreciate has been an honor and a privilege. Appreciate you as being always. here with us. And may Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And remember, we can do this series with Brother Bob Fishman be, and do this program because you make this network possible. This network is your network. And you make possible what, you, what we do by your gifts. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you.